good morning uh, everyone and, and welcome to you all. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar, which is organized by us at the Eric Kastrian Institute, uh, the Center for Climate Change in Energy and Environmental Law, trying to remember this all, and the GovTran Network, uh, which is uh, governing the EU's climate and energy transition in turbulent times. Um, and the, the project, of course, is, is funded by the Finnish Academy Strategic Research Council. Now, the project um, where we are all involved right now uh, is about climate change. And of course, uh, there's a lot of change um, in that area. Uh, the climate is changing, but of course, this climate change also requires a great deal of societal change. Uh, it requires a lot of policy changes. Um, however, um, very often when we're looking at how climate policies are debated, it appears like a debate among experts, experts working in many different domains, uh, such as climate, environment, traffic, economics, migration, and what have you. And they will discuss emissions and they will discuss which alternatives are good, which alternatives are bad, uh, how different things should be counted, a lot of numbers, what is the cost of them. And they debate all these technical details and means to the ends and the right balance be between all of these different technical solutions of which many of us understand very little. So this in a very, I think often appears like a debate among experts. And then of course, we all know that at some point these questions appear uh, on the political level. And, and for us that live in the EU, the level where these sort of appear in the news is very often a meeting of the European Council, which of course is decisive because that is where the various EU objectives for climate negotiations are often set. These are negotiations that take place largely behind closed doors. We know very little about them. Um, the EU, the European Council, it's not very big on democratic legitimacy. Whether national parliaments have any role uh, in debating the solutions, the alternatives, depends of course on national constitutions. In Finland, we're not doing very badly on that. Our parliament is relatively involved, but also we know that in many other countries, this is not so. Uh, national parliaments know fairly little about what happens in the European Council. But I think overall this process in which political leaders strike deals behind closed doors, uh, very late at night um, is not great uh, for openness or citizen involvement. Uh, it's not the best place for making democratic choices that involve all of us, that affect all of us, and that are then actually transformed into international obligations uh, in climate negotiations, and later, of course, transposed international legislation in member states. And at that point, uh, debate is often too late. The choices have already been made. Um, in this project, we believe that uh, climate policies, they need to be sustainable uh, in many ways. Of course, sustainable in the sense of let's save the planet, but of course, sustainable also in the sense of uh, being anchored into proper democratic debates and discussions. Democratically sustainable policies, they cannot be made by experts acting at expert level, nor can they be made in the European Council or prime minister striking deals somewhere uh, in Justus Lipsius late at night. Uh, we think that in order for climate policies to be sustainable also in the democratic sense, we have to bring in the people. And this is what our project is about. It's about finding ways to engage people in climate decisions before the decisions are taken, but also about identifying channels uh, for challenging uh, and debating and also contesting these policies again before it's too late before the solutions have already been uh, taken. This is what, in our view, makes these policies also democratically sustainable. Now, the EU, of course, it has many channels to ensure 
participatory democracy. And many of them uh, are sort of more general. They're not climate policy specific, but general. The most obvious one would be the European Citizens Initiative, which exists specifically for the purpose of providing a channel for participatory democracy. However, if you look at how it has been implemented by the EU, I think it is fair to say that it has been quite effectively killed by, by the institutions and the European Commission in particular. It has not been a great success, simply because the initiatives, they don't fly. They die somewhere in the process. Uh, we also have an access to documents regulation, which is specifically about uh, opening up decision making in the EU, granting it broader legitimacy. Uh, it's a regulation that is already 20 years old. It is needs to be updated. And as the Commission concluded already in 2008, it's not in line with the Aarhus uh, Convention. It includes two broad exceptions. It makes too little space for public interest and uh, it is also applied for the institutions very, very restrict restrictively. And then, of course, there is the very intriguing option of climate litigation, which is something that uh, we are already organized an event around that last year. And I think it's a, an, an issue that we can promise to come back to uh, very soon, very topical. However, today we zoom in on the Aarhus regulation. Why? Uh, this is the International Convention, the Aarhus Convention is the convention that uh, aims to create specifically a set of participatory environmental rights. It's the special tool that should be applicable in this particular policy area. This is a convention that requires all parties to collect environmental information, make sure that it's effectively disseminated, uh, that the, the public can effectively participate in decision making and also ensure that these rights are effective, that they can in fact be applied uh, by the people and that there is effective access to justice. Now we know, we all know that the EU has not really lived up to these commitments. The monitoring body, the Conventions Compliance Committee has concluded many times that the way that the EU is implementing uh, the convention is not in line, it's not uh, enough. And this applies in particular to questions of insufficient administrative and judicial redress. Uh, to us in this project, in addition, it would also seem that uh, the institutions supply um, environmental information, the concept very narrowly. And this is something that we have already started to test. We don't have results yet, but we will come back to this uh, question uh, later. Um, we are also very concerned that this issue of litigation cost is on the in increase. Um, it's a tendency uh, in the EU that we're very worried about and which we definitely uh, wish to uh, follow up. But also all of these questions also involve questions of, as I said, administrative and judicial redress. These are topical because the, the regulation is currently being updated. However, it seems to us that both the Commission and the Council have been reluctant uh, to address uh, the biggest concerns uh, with this regulation. Uh, this is an area where we so far have not worked. And uh, that's why we have invited over some of the people that we're collaborating with, the people that we know to be experts on these questions. And we've asked them to share uh, with us what they know about these topics uh, with the view of, um, in a way, uh, laying down a research agenda for the project, uh, which we then we will pursue in this project uh, also hopefully together with the people that are here today. Um, and that is basically, if I sum up uh, what we're trying to do today. Um, I was asked to share um, three housekeeping rules. <laughs> the first one is that if you have questions, please ask them at any time. Do it in the Q&A um, box, uh, which you will find uh, on your screen, on the right, at least on mine, it's on the right-hand side. Uh, and if there are questions that you find particularly pertinent, like them, because that makes that, um, if you see someone else already asking a question that you're interested in, uh, you can like it instead of asking it again. 
The second thing is that uh, the event uh, will be uh, recorded, uh, just for your information, uh, in the interest of transparency. Um, and then finally, I think I can um, return the microphone to Tina and Haro, to, so who can take on and, and actually introduce the speakers that we have here today. Right. Thank you, Pivy, for this excellent introduction and good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Welcome to everyone also on my behalf. So my name is Harald van Asselt and I'm a professor of climate law and policy at the University of Eastern Finland. Now, in the interest of time, I will move straight on to introducing our first speaker, who is Emily Barrett. And Dr. Barrett is a lecturer in tort law and a co-director of the Transnational Law Institute at King's College but she also is a center fellow at the Cambridge Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance at Cambridge University. But perhaps most importantly, she is the author of, I would say, one of the, the most important books, or at least one of the most important recent books about the IROS Convention, uh, which is called The Foundations of the IROS Convention, Environmental Democracy, Rights and Stewardship. It was published only last year by, by Hart Publishing. And given that, and given her experience, uh, not just on the Irish Convention, but also on, on uh, climate law and policy, she's probably one of the best people uh, we can think of to kick off this seminar. So Emily, uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. I don't think I've ever had such a nice introduction. Um, and now I feel a bit embarrassed. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, have I shared my screen properly? No. Not no, yet. okay, sorry. Um, okay, here we go. So yes, um, I have written a book about the Aarhus Convention, but the book is largely uh, looking underneath the surface of the convention. Um, and so I'm not, uh, I haven't been looking at its current implementation, but um, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Uh, and the title that Tina, I think came up for this presentation, which I love, is the other trinity in the Aarhus Convention. Um, and I wanted to associate myself with the coolest trinity, I think, um, in existence, which is trinity from the matrix. Um, I'm not saying that this trinity is that cool, I just, just wanted the association. Um, so the trinity that uh, I am concerned with, rep, rep is, is looks at the values that animate and motivate the Aarhus Convention. So whilst many of us will be familiar of the, the actual trinity that we see with the Aarhus Convention, which corresponds to the access to environmental information, public participation in environmental decision-making and access to justice in environmental matters. So those tr that trinity represents the pillars of the Aarhus Convention. The trinity that I am concerned about looks down at the bottom, deep into the foundations of the Aarhus Convention. And it is these, this trinity that I think supports the actual trinity of the, the three pillars uh, and helps to make sure that they are actually meaningful and not just a, a set of mere procedural rights um, that have no life. So why identify this second trinity uh, in the Aarhus Convention? Well, I think that there is an awful lot that is going on in the Aarhus Convention. Um, and to illustrate, I want to read to you from the introduction um, of the implementation guide, which was written um, um, amongst others by Stephen Steck. Um, and this introduction, I think, gives you a flavor of the kind of instrument that the Aarhus Convention is supposed to be. It's a little bit long, but um, I think it, it bears um, reading in, in full. So this, they say of the Aarhus Convention that it links environmental rights and human rights, acknowledges that we owe an obligation to future generations, and establishes that sustainable development can be achieved only through the involvement of all stakeholders. It links government accountability and environmental protection. It focuses on interactions between the public and public authorities in a democratic context, and is forging a new process for public participation in the negotiation and implementation of international agreements. The subject of the Aarhus Convention goes to the heart of the relationship between people and governments. The convention is not only an environmental agreement, it is also an agreement about environmental accountability, transparency, and responsiveness. That's, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, 
I think if the convention were to be entering into a beauty pageant, it would be standing before the audience, declaring its wish for world peace. There isn't much that the convention doesn't want within its scope. Um, and I think just to another illustration um, comes from the most recent strategic plan for the artist convention that says that um, the convention is part of our broader aspiration to achieve a more equitable world and a better quality of life for all. So we simply cannot look at the convention as a mere procedural instrument. It is a rich and ambitious um, piece of environmental law that is driven by its purposes. So the only way to understand how we interpret uh, the convention is to look beneath the surface and to figure out what those purposes are. Now, uh, if you recall any of the things in that list, you will realize that there are way more than just three. Um, the foundations don't just represent a trinity of purposes, it's a, a plethora of many different purposes. Uh, but in order to be manageable for me, um, I focus on just three, um, these three purposes, environmental democracy, environmental rights, and environmental stewardship. Um, and whilst I chose three uh, as a matter of just practicality, I think these three purposes actually are central to the vision of the Aarhus Convention and are also mutually reinforcing. So each of them contributes to the other vision. And without these aspects of the Aarhus Convention's foundations, the, the other doesn't work as fully as it could. So I'm just going to run through um, why I think these, each of these are a foundational purpose of the ICE Convention. Um, and then in the questions, if anyone wants to, to kind of dig a bit further, um, we can do. So the first of the three purposes that I look at, which um, I don't say is the most important, but it is the most obvious. There was an enormous fanfare about environmental democracy when the convention um, was uh, signed. And Kofi Annan in the introduction to the implementation guide says that this is the most ambitious adventure in the area of environmental democracy so far undertaken under the auspices of the United Nations. That's quite a claim. Um, and elsewhere, others have described it as a flagship, as a leading instrument. Really, you cannot read something about the Aarhus Convention without environmental democracy cropping up. But it's not just a, a kind of a, a flashy um, idea that it gets associated with, the, with the, the convention. If we look at what the convention is trying to promote, public participation supported by access to information and access to justice, there is at least a flavor of something democratic that exists in the heart of the convention. So this is the first purpose, environmental democracy. Now, the second um, of these um, foundational purposes in this trinity uh, is environmental rights. And this of the three purposes that I look at is the most um, tricky to get our kind of to get our head around. And I describe it as a riddle in the heart of the convention. And the reason why I think it's a riddle is because of the language of Article 1, which says this, to contribute to the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environment adequate to her, his or her health and well-being. So we have this very tricksy language of to contribute to the right of. The convention later on goes to guarantee the rights of access to information, public participation and access to justice, but it doesn't quite guarantee this access to a substantive environmental right. So there's something there. The convention wants to in some ways promote substantive environmental rights, this right to live in an environment adequate to health and, and well-being, but as we see from the language of the convention, it doesn't quite get us there. Um, and there are a number of reasons why this is, this is the case. Um, when a the first idea, kind of the first kernel of the idea for something that might look like the Aarhus Convention was introduced, it was very much a convention about substantive environmental rights. Um, but slowly, slowly, as the process of negotiation went on, this right is watered down. And indeed, one of the responsible parties is um, the UK, my own country, um, and they uh, emphatically did not want um, to guarantee a, a substantive right. So we have this 
allusion to a right to a healthy environment without it quite being there. So we have this, this riddle, but it's nevertheless an animating purpose of the convention. Even if the convention doesn't actively guarantee uh, as a kind of a legal entitlement, the right to a healthy environment, this right is central to understanding what the convention wants to do. So even if it's just a moral imperative that motivates the other th the three pillars, the other three rights, it exists and we can't ignore it. We can't claim that the convention is all about environmental, substantive environmental rights, but we also can't say that they, um, they don't exist. So that's the, the, the second of the Trinity. And then finally, um, in this Trinity is environmental stewardship, which I describe as a, a persistent whisper in the Aarhus Convention. Uh, and this is because unlike environmental democracy and unlike environmental rights, Stewardship doesn't appear anywhere in the text of the convention or in any of its implement, implementation um, uh, in its implement uh, I've the word, in, in its kind of strategic plans or, or its um, the documents that describe how it should be implemented. Nevertheless, stewardship is there in kind of the ether of the convention, uh, and we see various references to this idea of stewardship um, at various points. So if we take, in fact, the first preambulatory recital of the convention, which refers us back to the Stockholm Convention, which gives us a clue that um, a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment motivates the Aarhus Convention. Uh, and we see various other references to this idea of responsibility, the need to protect, um, the need to improve the environment, which gives us an indication that the stewardship is somehow underpinning what the convention uh, wants to do. <clears throat> and the reason why stewardship, I think, is an important foundational purpose of the convention is that without this moral imperative that the convention is about doing something for the environment, the rights that the procedural rights that the convention um, guarantees can be abused. Um, you can access environmental information because you're a corporation who wants to use that information um, to your advantage. So you know how to manipulate um, a process. But because we have this imperative that actually the access to environmental information is not supposed to be a selfish right, it's supposed to be a right to enable better stewardship. Um, we see that this is what the convention is intended for. Um, and just to carry on in that theme, just to give you a flavor, um, I can again talk more after uh, in the discussion. Um, these, um, these purposes help to um, uncover the full interpretive possibility of the Aarhus Convention. Uh, and I'll just give you one illustration. So if we look at Article 2.5, of the convention, which defines what um, the public can, or who has access to these various rights um, as being the public concerned. Uh, it doesn't give us much more of a clue than that, uh, but if we see the convention as promoting um, environmental stewardship in order to facilitate environmental democracy, we would see that the public concerned are people who are concerned with protecting the environment concerned with understanding environmental quality. Um, so that's, that's where uh, I will leave it. These three purposes that animate um, the convention, I think are essential to understand the text of the convention. Um, and I, I welcome further questions in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Emily, not just for a very thought provoking uh, introduction, but also for sticking well to the time. I was going to give you a heads up at two minutes, but that wasn't even necessary. Um, so undoubtedly, you'll have an opportunity to oh. say some more at the, at the discussion at the Q&A later on. And, but also thanks for, for this, this introduction, for, thanks for reminding us of, of the other trinity of the other three purposes of the convention. Um, and for me also for putting the, the picture in my head of the Iris Convention as the winner in the beauty pageant, uh, which is something that will stick to me for, for after this, this webinar as well. Um, we'll now move on to uh, our next speaker who will uh, take us a little bit more down the, the rabbit hole of the revision of the Iris regulation at the EU level. And again, I think we have uh, probably one of the best possible speakers uh, on, the, on this topic with us. Um, our next speaker is Mariolina Eliantonio. 
And Professor Antonio is Professor of European and Comparative Administrative Law and Procedure at Maastricht University. And among her areas of work, she focuses on the enforcement of European law before both national and EU courts. This, of course, also includes uh, the work on access to ju justice in environmental matters, which brings us back to the IRIS Convention and specifically the IRIS regulation at the EU level. Um, again, uh, Marilina, uh, I didn't even mention it to Emily, but also for you, you have 15 minutes. Um, I will give you a heads up, a two minute warning uh, at, at 13 minutes um, and at 15 minutes, I'll ask you to wrap it up. Uh, but you have the floor and 15 minutes are yours. Thank you very much, uh, Haro, and uh, thank you especially also Paivi and, and Tina for uh, having me here today. And uh, as, as Haro says, this is a topic I have been working on for, for a long time, and uh, um, it keeps on being open and topical. The EU institutions uh, in general keep on disappointing us, so that's a great opportunity for me to say how frustrating that is. So um, the, the, um, the part of, of the talk that of, of this seminar, let's say, that uh, I will cover um, is uh, the, the ARUS regulation. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, my talk is very much complementary uh, to the talk of Joanna, which is coming later, uh, and which will be more focused on uh, judicial protection. Because of course, as Pivey mentioned in the very beginning, administrative and judicial review are to some extent two sides of the same uh, disappointing coin that we are faced with when it comes to um, uh, environmental um, justice and environmental uh, democracy more in general. Um, so, um, of course, uh, uh, the Arus Convention, as we know, is, is a mixed agreement, is binding on the EU and the member states. Um, and uh, what we are focusing on today, of course, is that part of the scheme. So in as far as uh, kind of uh, the Arus Convention is binding, again, on the EU institutions and its member states as a matter of EU law. Um, now, for the purposes, of course, of the Arus regulation, what we are more particularly fo focusing on um, is um, administrative and then subsequently judicial review uh, before uh, the EU institutions and before the EU Court of Justice. But of course, in the system of multi-level judicial protection of, uh, of the, um, the EU and the member states, uh, there will be some reference, let's say, to the member state level, uh, although as such the focus is on um, access to justice and also access to uh, administrative review um, for actions of the EU institutions and not actions of the member states. So that's a first caveat to um, delimit the scope of, of my talk. Um, now, this is a, a, a picture uh, or a scheme uh, that Johanna will also show uh, in a moment in, in her talk, and that shows also how complementary our, our presentations are. Um, and that is a, a scheme that, in fact, the Commission uh, itself uses uh, to show that uh, uh, in order to challenge uh, omissions, acts and omission in environmental matters that are uh, stemming from the EU, uh, there are um, in, in, in essence, uh, let's say, two avenues of judicial review, the action for annulment and uh, actions before national courts, uh, but there is, in first instance, uh, an administrative review procedure, the one that is set up and, uh, uh, and further elaborated in Article 10 of the ARUS regulations. So the topic of, of my presentation today uh, is uh, the, uh, the internal review procedure as it is set out in the ARUS regulation. And uh, as I said, then Johanna will take it over uh, to look more at the judicial uh, review part. And um, now, uh, what, where, where does the story start? It starts from the fact that the EU um, imp tried to implement uh, the, the ARUS convention when it signed and ratified it. And as far as the um, EU institutions are concerned, it set out this mechanism of internal review, according to which uh, uh, environmental uh, NGOs um, need, before having access to court, uh, to make a so-called request for internal review, um, a kind of objection procedure, say, if you have it in, in several of the member states of the EU. Um, uh, but this is only available to them uh, when an EU institutional body has adopted an administrative act under environmental law or uh, has omitted to adopt such an act. Uh, now, where uh, is the trick in all of that? Uh, that the, um, the administrative, the notion of administrative act is further defined in the ARUS regulation as a measure of individual scope. Now, uh, of course, the 
the key to, uh, to this discussion is uh, what is a measure of individual scope? Well, it's not a measure of general scope. Well, that, then what is a measure of general scope? We don't know, or rather, um, we, we, we don't know explicitly from the treaty because the treaty does not really define neither what is a measure of general scope nor what is a measure of individual scope. What is also missing at the EU level is what the Germans call an Handlungsformenlehre, so a doctrine of administrative action. So there is no such dogmatic categorizations in the EU uh, of what is measures of individual scope, what are measures of general scope. So this kind of came in incrementally to be defined by the case law of the Court of Justice. In general, not per se in relation to the ARUS regulation, but of course this uh, assumed a totally different connotation with respect to the, um, to the ARUS regulation problem, because the, the, the notion of individual versus general scope is the gateway through which you have access to this individual, um, uh, to this internal review procedure. So, um, are regulations uh, measures of individual scope? No, clearly not, and that is pretty um, uh, undebatable, let's say. Uh, so regulations are, per definition, measures of general scope. This is also, to some extent, uh, general application, to some extent also hinted in, in the treaty. Um, and um, it's also been um, mentioned by the Court of Justice and, and repeated also in internal review procedures that whether they are now legislative or not in nature, regulations can never be measures of general scope. Now, what about decisions? Decisions are um, uh, binding on those to whom they are addressed. So can they be measures of general scope? Largely, in fact, not. So decisions uh, that are uh, addressed to member states, so um, several decisions that are also relevant for the topic of today in environmental matters and climate change in the specifics, um, they, are, uh, they have been defined by uh, the Commission uh, in internal review procedures and further supported by the Court of Justice as measures of general scope, because although they have a specific addressee, a uh, member state. Nevertheless, they applied in a, a general and abstract way uh, to everybody in the member state. And the, the famous case where this was uh, at, at stake, uh, I will return to this case later on, is this, uh, this case uh, brought by um, two Dutch NGOs, Vereniging Milieu Defensie and Stichting Natur en Milieu, uh, which concerned a decision addressed to the Netherlands in the framework of air quality regulation, where um, it was the Commission had concluded and the Court of uh, Justice eventually backed it up or backed it up, let's say, uh, uh, that this is a measure of, of general scope. Um, so essentially, um, what remains are decisions addressed to individual persons, so to individual natural and legal persons. These are the only decisions which can be considered of individual scope. Um, as a consequence, this uh, uh, brings <clears throat> a very limited access to internal review procedure, which so far has been available mostly uh, or overwhelmingly only for um, chemicals decisions and GMOs uh, decisions. So the, the usefulness of this internal review procedure is quite debatable. Now, the question is then what can you do as an NGO? Well, you have received a um, uh, uh, rejection in a, your internal review um, procedure. So what can you do? Well, of course, you can go to court against the denial for a request of the internal review procedure, except that, as the Dutch say, uh, uh, the monkey comes out of the sleeve. The trick is that the claim will relate only to the internal review itself. So the decision which constituted the reply to your internal review procedure and request, but not to the original decision, which was the one that the NGO actually cared about. So what is the outcome of this uh, old setup is that the inter internal review procedure is an essentially useless tool for environmental NGOs. Now, um, this was um, uh, recognized in this very long, um, uh, say, let's not call it litigation, it's not litigation, but uh, say um, mechanism or um, uh, complaint procedure, uh, which uh, has been uh, brought before the compliance committee, where uh, the committee eventually um, concluded that uh, the internal review procedure 
coupled with limited access to justice possibilities, which also Joanna will go into depth in the next presentation, is in violation of the Arus Convention. So the EU, as we all know, is currently in violation of the Arus Convention and its commitment under the Arus Convention. Now, is the Court of Justice as guardian of EU law and also the EU commitments under international law doing something about it? Because there is clearly a situation here of an piece of EU secondary law, the Arus regulation, in violation of the international commitment enters into by the EU. No, the Court of Justice is not doing anything about it because um, without needing to go into the technical details of this, it concluded, um, in my opinion, uh, cowardly, that it did not have the jurisdiction, the competence to uh, control whether the Arus regulation is in compliance with the Arus Convention. So it didn't say it is or it is not. It said, well, I can't control it because of certain um, uh, earlier case law, um, which is, in my opinion, uh, very of very dubious applicability in uh, the story uh, at stake here. Uh, bottom line is that the Court of Justice has not been very helpful in this um, whole story. Um, so the ball was back in the court of the Commission. Um, so is the Commission doing something to um, to repair this violation of uh, the uh, EU uh, of the Arus Convention. Uh, and that's where uh, we go to the modern days. Uh, so there is a recent proposal for an amendment of the Arus regulation um, where uh, the commission uh, very uh, triumphantly uh, said, well, we are uh, so open, so democratic. Uh, we want to comply with the Arus uh, uh, convention because we truly believe in it. Uh, so we want to move from uh, administrative act and being an act of individual scope to uh, cover also non-legislative acts with uh, legally binding and external effects, except if union law explicitly requires implementing measures at union or national level. So um, moving from this, um, in a way, narrow, narrower definition of uh, administrative act in the earlier formulation of the Arus regulation, uh, this uh, proposal now uh, offers a, a slightly broader definition of an, uh, an administrative act for the purposes of the Arus regulation, because it has at least abandoned this uh, idea of uh, an act being only of individual scope. So it goes to cover also acts which are of general scope, however, um, only if they are uh, legally binding and with external effects, and only if there are no foreseen implementing measures at union or uh, national level. Now, the, uh, of course, uh, ensuing question is, um, should we be happy about it? Um, is this um, a, a good step uh, in the right direction? And um, I think it is to some extent. So it is certainly a, a step forward and a, a step in the correct direction. Uh, but uh, one should not overlook that there are very important exclusions uh, as a consequence of this new definition of administrative act under the Arus regulation, which will never nevertheless excludes several important um, measures from the internal review procedure and especially, and that's what I will uh, show uh, now, that the, in a way the logics behind the rationale of the system of internal and then judicial review has not fundamentally changed. And that's where, in my opinion, the problem lies. Now, um, first of all, uh, the, the, the current the definition or sorry, the proposed definition of, um, of administrative act excludes uh, legislative acts. Um, second, it also excludes acts uh, without legally binding effect. And um, uh, those who know me know me that uh, uh, the other thing I rant about, uh, apart from the Arus Convention, is uh, the lack of judicial review of soft law. So that gives the opportunity to do my uh, second, um, kind of to, to ride my second ranting horse, um, which is the fact that, of course, uh, soft law, as we know, um, produces very important legal and especially practical practical effect. Um, it uh, uh, induces, and this we have uh, proven with uh, um, 
uh, are quite thorough research in several member states, but also at the EU level, it induces a change of behavior uh, in the addressees. So it is um, very debatable uh, that it would be excluded from the internal review procedure, considering that also judicial review procedures are very limited when it comes to soft law measures in general and in environmental matters in particular. Yes, it's um, Yes. Um, it also uh, excludes acts without in external effects, which for similar reasons uh, than the one I just mentioned for soft law uh, is quite an important exclusion because also uh, acts that are only internal to the EU administration may have a self-binding effect and therefore can create uh, legal effects which are worth uh, reviewing. Um, and finally, and that's the last point I want to make, and that's the one that to me is the most worrisome, um, they, um, the current proposal uh, excludes acts which foresee EU or national implementing measures. And now I go back to my um, initial scheme. Um, why is this exclusion uh, here uh, provided in the proposal? Because according to um, the scheme that the Commission thinks is the correct scheme to understand the multi-level system of judicial protection in the EU, uh, when there is an act uh, that of implementation at national uh, level, then the correct forum uh, are the national courts. And if there is a problem with the underlying EU act, then access to justice is uh, ensured indirectly through the preliminary question of validity, meaning that the starting point, the logics behind the system is uh, this mantra repeated now since uh, Le Ver um, of the complete, allegedly complete system of remedies except that we all know that this is a unicorn. Uh, the complete system of remedies does not exist. It only exists in the mind of the commission, or I don't know if it exists in the commission, but at least they want to believe that maybe, or they want to make us believe that they believe it. I don't know. Um, why does the complete system of remedy not exist? Because uh, uh, standing conditions are largely determined by national law on the basis of the principle of national procedural autonomy. The commission could have done something about it, um, because uh, these standing uh, requirements can be very diverse, very varied, and therefore uh, provide different accesses to NGOs to eventually challenge indirectly EU law. But the Commission is not doing, doing much about it. They came up with this very lukewarm uh, Commission communication on access to justice a few years ago, where they basically said, well, you know, standing conditions need to uh, comply with the principle of effective yes, and effective judicial protection. Thank you. That's not something we didn't know before the communication. But now it's black and white in a Commission document. So, um, And uh, what has also been proven, and it's, again, black and white in a Commission document, is that preliminary questions of validity are used very, very rarely in practice. Um, they don't occur very often in environmental matters even less. And in order to close the last piece of the puzzle, um, even if there would not be national implementing measure, but only EU implementing measure, then anyway, you would have to wait for the EU implementing measures and raise a plea of illegality in front of the EU court. I am currently conducting research on the plea of illegality, and I have found out that since the Treaty of Lisbon, so that's 15 years, the plea of illegality in every EU policy has been used 23 times one of which successfully. So where is this complete system of remedies? The Commission still needs to show it to me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Marilina. Um, you call it a rant, I thought, call it a very engaging and critical analysis of, of the, the IRIS regulation. Um, and I think that also perfectly sets the stage uh, for someone who has been dealing with this uh, on a, a very practical basis. Um, so our next speaker uh, who will, uh, well, in part, respond to, to the previous presentation, but also probably uh, have, have a few things of her own to say, uh, is Anne Friel. And Anne is a lawyer with Client Earth Brussels office, uh, where she leads the organization, uh, where, where she leads Client Earth's work on environmental democracy in, in the EU, focusing, focusing specifically on implementation and enforcement of the Iris Convention. Now, more specifically, and this is, of course, where it gets very interested, uh, interesting. She was involved in Client Earth's complaint to the Irish Convention Compliance Committee against the EU on access to justice, uh, raising maybe some of the same issues that Marielina talked about in her previous presentation. Um, so, Anne, we have uh, 10 minutes for you. I will also give you a two minutes uh, heads up, but the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of the organizers for uh, inviting me to this really very rich discussion. Uh, on a topic that's very close to, to my heart and to my kind of daily life. Um, and particularly thanks to um, 
Emily and Mariolina, if I, I can call you by your first names, because we haven't really officially met before, um, for, the, for those, for those, uh, for those uh, presentations that certainly, yeah, um, I think that we can say that we're kindred spirits um, already, because, uh, yeah, I certainly echo a lot of the, a lot of the, of what you said. Um, so, as uh, Harrow said, I come to this topic from a, very much a practitioner's point of view. So at Client Earth, we're an, an, an environmental NGO, but we're made up mostly of lawyers um, and we use kind of legal avenues to protect the environment. And so the Aarhus Convention is very much um, at the centre of what we do. Um, and me and, and my team, we work to support all of our colleagues in using the rights uh, in, the, in the convention um, and also in pushing kind of for better implementation and enforcement of the convention in general, both in the member states and at, at the EU level. Um, so we, as environmental activists, we see very clearly the link between these um, procedural rights that are enshrined in the, in the convention and kind of positive environmental outcomes that we work towards. So when, when individuals and, and the organizations they create can exercise their rights to scrutinize decision-making and participate in it, and as a very last resort to, to challenge it when it, when it, when it doesn't um, comply with environmental law, we, we have some hope of making of making some progress. Um, so the question in, in, in this conference is about whether revising the Aarhus regulation can secure adequate legal protection uh, for uh, for climate action. So I think first of all I want to echo what what Emily said in that um, uh, we're talking about access to justice mostly here, but of course there are three pillars in the Aarhus Convention, and the EU is kind of lacking in all three of those pillars at the moment and a lot of progress has to be has to be made very quickly if um if the eu is really going to live up to its international um commitments under the paris agreement and also its domestic commitments that it's making in this huge push of of, of uh, environmental legislation making under the eu green deal so it really it's it's very time is of the essence that's for sure um, and obviously the eu plays a huge role in, um, in climate action uh, in the EU and obviously uh, internationally as well. And not just through legislation, but also through what have come to be known now as administrative acts, uh, non-legislative acts, basically. Um, there's, there's a, it's difficult to overestimate the power that the EU institutions hold um, in the, in the non-legislative decisions that they're taking on a daily basis, for example, defining the, lists, uh, the, the projects of common interest um, on um, transnational infrastructure, energy infrastructure projects. Um, they also you know, define the um, sustainable investments under the EU, uh, under the taxonomy regulation. The EU state aid decisions, they have a huge importance in terms of um, deciding what is going to be the, the balance between renewable and, and fossil fuel energy. Um, all of these decisions are, are hugely important. And yet there is really no way for individuals and NGOs to bring them before the Court of Justice when they when they breach um, the legislation that's passed by the by the EU co-legislators. Um, and that is to be contrasted with the fact that um, privileged applicants, for example, the member states and the other institutions, and often industry applicants do have access to challenge decisions that affect their own interests. So that imbalance, I think, certainly uh, plays a role in and how the EU institutions focus on protecting the environment when they know that they can be challenged for breaching other interests, but not, not from breaching environmental law that obviously um, has an impact and, and how, decision, how decisions are taken. So, so therefore, yeah, I absolutely uh, believe that the Aarhus regulation could potentially play an important role in providing greater legal protection if it's done uh, properly. <laughs> and so um, I think Marilina really outlined some of the, the main problems with the Commission's proposal and why we're, we're in a situation where after, um, well, now it's four years after the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee said really clearly that the EU is in breach of the access to justice provisions. And we've gone through this whole um, process to lead us here to this legislative proposal, we're, we're still in really big danger that the EU is going to miss the mark completely and that we're not going to make the progress that we need at this point. And that's uh, hugely, 
hugely problematic and, and uh, a, a really a really big waste of, of energy and, and resources. And um, so there's still a chance to, to you know, for, the, for the, the institutions to do the right thing. And um, the, the regulation entered trilogues last week. So this is really the last push. And I'm just going to talk about a few of the, the things that are still quite problematic and, and the reasons that the, the especially the Commission and the Council are putting forward for, for maintaining um, the, the kind of the, the problematic parts of the proposal. Um, so I'm going to hone in directly on this, this, this problem, which I, for me, from a practitioner's point of view, is probably going to be the most problematic, which is the exclusion from internal review of acts that require national implementing uh, measures. Um, that for us, we're very worried about it. It can really kind of hollow out the whole regulation of much of its effect. Many, if not most, EU administrative acts require national implementing measures at some point. I think an example would be um, one, what, one decision that has the NGOs have tried to challenge an internal review and obviously failed because of the admissibility criteria up to now have been like the authorizations of active substances like glyphosate, for example, which then are implemented through national um, authorizations of the products containing the, 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 the active substance. And so these, for example, would continue to be completely out of reach for us, as well as many of the other decisions that, I've, uh, that, that, that I already talked about. Um, so as Marilena explained, the logic for this of the Commission is that these measures should be challenged through the preliminary reference procedure. Um, and as an organisation that litigates also in member states, we know very well the problems with trying to to, to bring preliminary references both on interpretation of EU law and on validity. The fact that um, we are just not in control of whether the judge decides to, to refer the question, even after overcoming all of the admissibility and costs, barriers, et cetera, uh, we're just not in control of whether the judge does that. And that is probably the, you know, just one of the many problems uh, involved with um, this, this, this mechanism. Um, that's not to say that we don't value <laughs> the preliminary reference mechanism. We all know that it's of huge importance to the EU legal order, etc. But here we've got to really hone in on the fact that um, it, it's just clearly inadequate as the only mechanism for holding EU um, institutions to account um, for their for their decision making. Um, and that's really what I think some of the institutions don't really understand that this on it by itself is just not going to cut it in terms of bringing the EU into compliance. Um, so the question is then why is the EU kind of really, really insisting on, on this? And that sometimes is quite difficult to understand. There seems to be two different arguments put forward. Um, the first one is, is, is legal in nature and that there seem the the both the Council and the Commission seem to hint at the fact that allowing internal review of these measures is actually um, not in, is in, it clashes with the treaties. It's, it goes against the EU's legal order, um, which doesn't really stand up to very much scrutiny. I mean, obviously, I think that what they're saying is that um, the third non-treaty based avenue for judicial review is kind of, does not go along with the with the treaties, um, which is a bit ridiculous because, as Marilena said, internal review is a very different mechanism from either Article two six three or Article two six seven. It does not it doesn't result in, in an annulment or nullity of the of the underlying measure that we wanted to challenge in the first place. That's impossible, um, and so there's no reason really why it, it wouldn't be in conformity with the treaties. And so that brings me to the second argument we put up, which is a political. A political argument which is really kind of almost um almost religious in that it kind of raises the the preliminary reference procedure to this level of sanctity that is untouchable um in that um there's a lot of kind of anger i think that the Aarhus convention compliance committee would dare to question the, the, the preliminary reference procedure as the mechanism for um access to justice for for citizens um, I loved the unicorn that for me that I mean that really kind of <laughs> sums it up sums it up for me and I think that a lot of this overzealousness and these arguments being put forward by the commission and, and the council can certainly some of the responsibility lies with the court of justice of course for its kind of blind um, 
blind mantra of the of the complete system of, of legal remedies, which we we know is not is 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 does not have any relation to the reality of actually using the mechanism. Um, so, okay, yeah, I just want to finish by saying that this is uh, really this is very problematic, not only um, in terms of legal protection for climate action in the EU, but also in the wider European context. I want to end on the note that. Um, what the EU is doing by failing to bring the EU into compliance with the Arts Convention is very, very dangerous for the wider European and Central Asian region, which are all, you know, all of these countries, 47 different countries are, 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 are um, accepted to the Aarhus Convention. And it's, it's a rare international treaty with a functioning compliance mechanism, which is so, so valuable, um, not only in the EU, but to also some of the other um, countries that don't have such a strong, perhaps, uh, rule of law basis and for which the, the, the convention and the compliance mechanism really kind of bolsters their rights and their democratic rights as well as their environmental rights. So for the EU to be kind of the self-proclaimed leader in rule of law and, um, and environmental protection on the international stage to be weakening such a such a successful treaty and such a successful compliance mechanism is is really it's it's very damaging uh, for the future and it really kind of um casts a, a dark shadow over the eu's international relations and the in environmental protection and um, so that really has to be taken on board by the EU institutions before october because that's the meeting of the parties and that's when all of this um kind of uh, will will blow up basically and um, so that's the my final remark is to is, is is a plea that this will kind of be taken seriously in the in the very short weeks and months to come um, yeah i'm very happy to take questions right um, thank you and thanks for basically laying out what what is at stake um both in the eu but also more broadly in the context of the iris convention and well going well beyond the eu um, something that we'll return to also after the break um, so now to give everyone a chance to stretch their legs, to grab some tea or coffee, uh, basically have a quick comfort break. Um, we'll uh, reconvene in five minutes, so at five past the hour, and then uh, my colleague Tina Paloniti from Helsinki University will take over in the moderation. Um, in the meantime, just as a reminder, please use the Q&A box to leave us any comments, questions, any other things that you're thinking of, um, so that we can take it up in the discussion. But we'll see each other in uh, just a few minutes again. Now, welcome back all. Uh, also on my behalf, lovely to have you here and to have this excellent webinar launching our new legitimary massive project. It's been delightful to hear you and I really look forward to the upcoming talks yet. We are having four presenters or respondents in this second half of our webinar. I'll shortly introduce all and then give floor to them. We'll begin with a presentation by Joanna Hajiani, a lecturer in public law at the University of Cyprus. Before that, she was a Max Weber postdoctoral fellow at the European University Institute. Her doctoral thesis discussing the EU as a global regulator for environmental protection was shortlisted for the 2020 SLSP, the Prix Book Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholarship. And her latest publication include an article in the Common Market Law Review on judicial protection and the environment, missing pieces for a complete puzzle of legal remedies. And I think we'll hear more about that today. And then we will have a response by member of the European Parliament, Sirpa Pietikäinen. And she's been a Finnish member of the Parliament and European People's Party since 2008. And she's also a former minister uh, of environment from Finland. 
And within her work, Ms. Bietigen seeks to combine her two specialties, that of environment and economics. And at the European Parliament, she's a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, as well as the substitute member of the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety Committee. And after these EU level uh, talks, we will move to the international level, where Sebastian Twig will talk about, uh, it, who is a senior attorney for Center for International Environmental Laws, Climate and Energy Program based in Geneva. And Sebastian's work focuses primarily on promoting the integration of human rights and public particip participation in climate governance and in strengthening accountability for climate harms. And then for the very last response, we return to Haro, who is, as already mentioned, Professor of Climate Law and Policy with the University of Eastern Finland uh, Law School. Haro is an expert on interactions between international climate change governance and other fields of international governance. So with these short introductions, I give the floor to Joanna to hear our first uh, presentation of the second half. There. Good. And as also Harold did uh, in the first part, I'll give you the two minutes warning and you have 15 minutes in total. You confirm that you can see. Um... Yes. All good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. I will now mute myself. All right. Um, I would like to start by um, thanking the organizers for putting together this webinar and providing us the opportunity to discuss this important matter at this pivotal time when the AHUS regulation is being revised by the institutions. Although related to the AHUS regulation, uh, my presentation will not specifically focus on its application and its scope, as this has now been explained thoroughly um, by Margolina. Instead, uh, my presentation will focus on the restrictive access that applicants have directly before the court um, under Article 2634 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Bearing in mind uh, this idea that the effective legal protection uh, in environmental matters in the EU is achieved through a combination of different mechanisms which together are meant to provide a complete system of realities as the court has repeatedly put it, and the commission as well. I think understanding the court's approach in recent climate cases uh, demonstrates the extent of the gap of effective uh, legal protection in the EU. This is the importance of trying to fill the gap to the best extent possible through alternative avenues of access to justice, including through the AHUS regulation, and also possibly to Article 12 of the AHUS regulation, which is meant to grant access to the court uh, to challenge both procedural and substantive legality of uh, the internal review uh, uh, procedure. Access to the court directly under Article 2634 uh, was the one aspect that the Commission and Council clarified from the outset. This will not form part of their strategy in trying to comply with the findings of the AHUS Convention Compliance Committee. They cannot tell the court how to interpret the treaty provision and they're constrained by separation of power issues within the EU. The court's approach in recent cases specifically is significant in understanding if there is some flexibility or willingness on the part of the court to adjust its approach to standing and particularly to the interpretation of individual consent to 634, um, particularly in climate cases. Now, the common interpretation of individual consent, which requires applicants to be affected by some special attributes that differentiate them and distinguish them um, from everyone else akin to applicants to which the acts are actually addressed has led consistently to a denial of standing in environmental cases for residents nearby an environmentally degrading activity, economic operators, environmental NGOs. 
I draw attention to different strategies that have been used over the years before the court, either to try and prove individual concern in environmental cases, or at least try to convince the court um, to change its interpretation uh, in these kinds of cases. And I focus on how these strategies have been used in two recent climate cases, which demonstrate that the climate, it's not so different in the eyes uh, of the court. I will be focusing on two key recent climate cases um, that have been decided at first instance by the general court and on appeal by the court of justice. Again, differences, but I will not get into those uh, today. I will be focusing on key elements that come out uh, of them uh, for our discussions uh, for the webinar today. And Garvalo, also known as the People's Climate Case, um, a group of individuals and NGOs challenged the legality of EU acts on climate change policy. They challenged the legality of the Recast Renewable Energy Directive for including forest biomass in its scope, uh, challenging um, the appropriateness of this move due to the amount of emissions from and the intensity of logging involved in its use. So uh, the, um, the applicants challenged the legality of multiple EU measures that set the EU's ambition to cut greenhouse gas emissions at that time uh, by at least 40% uh, by 2030. They claimed that this was not sufficiently high, infringing higher rules of law, including Paris Agreement and so on. Now, the first strategy that they tried and which has been um, put forward uh, even in the first case where Plowman was applied to an environmental uh, um, uh, dispute, was that interests affected by environmental issues, by climate change, are different, are collective, uh, they're not predetermined, they don't form part of a closed class, according to Plowman, which the court early dismissed as is irrelevant. The type of interest affected, whether economic or not, does not alter the court's approach. And I think the way in which the general court in Stabo um, reiterated, reiterated this sort of uh, reasoning is quite remarkable because the court said that the protection and regulation of the environment affects everyone in both current and future generations. And this fact militates against the notion of individual concern. Now, the court's approach contrasts with a recent approach, for example, adopted by the German Constitutional Court, which introduced the protection of future generations and the principle of intergenerational equity into the German Constitution, ordering the government to increase its um, mitigation strategies in order to avoid placing a disproportionate burden on future generations to reduce CO2 emissions. And the court essentially, again, reiterates, even in the climate context, that the large number of people potentially affected by climate change essentially acts as a barrier for them to have access to the court. Individual concern in the eyes of the court is a test of intensity rather than a test of scope, uh, um, reconfirmed particularly in this context. The second strategy, which is actually the one that I'm gonna spend less time on because the court very clearly and briefly dismissed the relevance of the Athos Convention. Um, has been tried in many different environmental cases. And here we see where the court really plays a significant role as the gatekeeper of international law and really the effects of Aarhus Convention in the EU legal order have to pass through the gates of the court uh, to have significant impact in individual cases. As many of you know, the court has denied direct effect to Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Convention it has also uh, um, clarified that it cannot consistently interpret Article 2634 in light of Article 93 because it cannot prevail over the treaty. And this Plomon is compatible. It's simply part of the criteria that contracting parts to the Aarhus Convention can impose under Article 93. In SAPO specifically, they also um, added a, a different uh, side to it, saying it's just simply a matter of scope. The Aarhus Convention does not apply where public authorities are acting in their legislative capacity. So the application of Aarhus is excluded since the measures challenged were of legislative nature. 
then for the climate perspective, climate legislative measures adopted under the ordinary legislative procedure are the ones usually that set out at least the EU's climate mitigation targets. Um, and therefore we see that the Aarhus Convention cannot uh, really have an effect on how um, uh, access to justice to challenge those kinds of measures will be applied by the court. The strategy that was tried um, links to the principle of effective judicial protection, um, which is also uh, recognized under Article 47 of the Charter on Fundamental Rights. The court recognized its importance, but again emphasized that this cannot set aside a provision of the treaty. <laughs> the court again clarifies effective judicial protection does not equal a right, unfettered right, to an annulment procedure. Elsewhere, other pieces of the puzzle of the full system of remedies should give you the answers, including the preliminary reference um, uh, procedure on validity and the illegality action that Mariolina mentioned earlier. Court's approach, even, the, even though the applicants highlighted that what we're seeking, what we're challenging here, cannot really be remedied through national courts, since we're challenging the level of ambition at the EU level. Um, but this was really not relevant uh, uh, for the court. Briefly, that this strategy is very problematic in the sense that it has influenced, combined with Article 93 of the Aarhus Convention, the court's approach in determining access to national courts. Article 93 have led the court to establish obligations for national courts to ensure wide access to national courts to challenge potential violations of EU environmental law, even when secondary legislation does not specifically provide for it. So, Habitats Directive and under the Water Framework Directive. double standards in, in, in uh, identifying the obligations of courts in ensuring access to justice. And even though we don't have a similar climate case, this logic that access to national courts uh, should guarantee effective judicial protection very much influences the court's reasoning in climate cases as well. Quite novel in the sense that applicants both in Sabo and Gavallo tried something different. They argued that they would be individually concerned because their fundamental rights were being infringed. And this infringement was unique and different for each of the individuals. This approach, it's not surprising that the court uh, rejected uh, this sort of argumentation along these, the following lines. The fundamental rights, the high-ranking rules of law, they need to be respected. But assuming that an act infringement infringes those rules does not mean that they're individually concerned. The court insists on the Plumman formulation that has to be distinguished. And specifically, the court says, well, every individual is likely to be affected by climate change in one way or another. The fact that the effects of climate change are different for each of the individuals does not equal in the approach is quite different from what we see in national courts, including most recently by the Dutch District Court in interpreting the obligations of a operation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, which was partly based on the understanding that there is widespread international consensus that human rights offer protection against the impacts of dangerous climate change. The court doesn't even get into the discussion of the, of the substantive issues because it just uses this sort of argumentation to also close the door to applicants to have uh, uh, access to the court. Also tried to convince the court that Plamen is not the only possible interpretation, that actually in its case law, sometimes it applies a more flexible approach. And if that's the case, why not apply it in relation to climate change cases? The first two 
specifically on the court's interpretation in Godogniu, where the court more flexibly established individual concern on the basis of a loss of unacquired rights. In that case, it was a trademark to use a label Clément for identifying a sparkling wine. Well, our interests, our rights will be distinguished in a different way because we live or have property near uh, forests. So uh, our rights, the, our exercise of our rights uh, is dependent on forests. But the court very briefly dismissed this argumentation uh, and said that you're just not differentiated from the whole body of uh, EU citizens. Sorry, Diana, I would be giving the two minutes warning now. cases where the court not so often has applied more flexible interpretation to individual concern like competition law cases or even back uh, uh, when the court recognized standing rights to the European Parliament when this was not provided in the treaties. There seems to be sometimes uh, the tendency that ideological parameters might influence the court's approach and if that's the case then why shouldn't climate change influence uh, the court's approach, and uh, these would change the discrepancies that apply at the moment where economic operators have more rights to challenge the authorization of a potentially dangerous substance than environmental NGOs or the public. Uh, overall, the court insisted in this recent climate cases on its long-standing rationale that effective judicial protection will come through the complete system of remedies. Interestingly, um, it seems to have also thrown the, the ball to the treaty makers. The General Court and the Court of Justice in Sabo specifically, after recognizing the paramount importance of environmental protection and access to justice, they said, well, these are the limits of judicial interpretation. But states could amend the treaties to ensure a different system of legal remedies in environmental matters. So it might be time to consider if you want to be positive and, um, and see it in a, a sort of uh, positive light, um, revising the treaty to create a specialized standing test. It sort of reminds the court of justice approach uh, in UPA right before the revision of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, but until then, the alternative avenues under the Acts regulation and access to national courts, which can lead to preliminary references or validity, remain people. The references on validity, in light of their different nature and the rare use uh, uh, of this mechanism today, which uh, Mariolina uh, also referred to, I don't think it offers a panacea to the EU shortcomings for guaranteeing access to justice, that both the court and the commission especially for member states that have strict standing requirements, Cyprus is one of those member states. So in this context, the importance of the Arthur's regulation as a key piece of the puzzle of legal remedies, I think becomes even more uh, visible. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and I look forward to the discussion and questions that will follow. Thank you, Iana. It was very comprehensive and thank you also for ending with a positive note, because for me that unfolded like a horror story. Tried this, didn't work out. Tried that, didn't work out either. <laughs> so we'll continue in the discussion from that. But now I would like to give the floor to Member of the Parliament, Sirpa Pietikainen, for your response, please. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, let me start by apologizing my voice. It is because of the allergy, a lot of pollen in the air. So try to survive with me. Then secondly, uh, wholehearted uh, thank you for the presentation so far. They have been very enriching and uh, thought provoking for me uh, who has been working since the beginning of the whole whose convention we did and in the European Parliament. I hope you could include me in your networks of things uh, uh, of thinkers and to send me that kind of sort of interpretation suggestions in the future. And I hope vice versa that I can include you. Okay, and then please do remind, I'm not a lawyer, so I uh, come up to the issue from the policy perspective. And first of all, if you go a bit of uh, dated backwards, 
there's this kind of paradigm change going on very slowly within the interpretation, what are the property rights and who has rights and what are the rights as you know very well. And to me, uh, sort of a, the triangle was um, uh, uh, in, the, in the 90s of having uh, the Rio uh, Convention, uh, Rio, um, uh, uh, in, in Rio, having the Earth Charter and the Convention on, on Climate Change and Biodiversity, even though they are not perfect. What the Earth Charter says is basically that we are talking about the common good. And in a sort of a hand in hand with that kind of a principle goes the whole who's uh, convention. And thank you for excellent startup with the session about this interpretation, how it relates to democracy and uh, whispering about the right uh, for a good environment of, of individuals because it is in there. And uh, uh, then sort of a giving this kind of a broader platform, not only this kind of a technical avenue for information, because that indeed was the sort of a kickoff. And then if you sort of a compl uh, complement it with the environmental impact assessment that is far from perfect, the ideology behind there is the same. You do not have unlimited rights, even though you would uh, uh, act upon according legislation to destroy or do whatever to the environment. You need to take that into account. And of course, this is the big fight, what we are having biodiversity strategies here and there. But what is worrying is that if I look the last 10 years or 20 years, actually the in interpretation has been falling back to that kind of unspoken idea that if you act according to uh, regulation, that means that the part of property rights is the right to consume, right to destroy, and right to pollute. And this is the thing that we were, we would need to uh, uh, need to challenge. And just would like to give you a, a quick reference on this thinking you might have noticed as the network in European Parliament pushing forward the concept of ecocide. And uh, uh, this is something what we try to push up on, on the Aarhus Convention and uh, in various other places. The latest is about the uh, EU's position to the next uh, UN General Assembly. And the ecocide, uh, uh, as you might know, has, has two interpretations. Um, and I like sort of combining the both. The one is, of course, the destruction of nature as a public common good even though it wouldn't have any impact to anyone. And this is the broader and more ambitious, but then the second that could be useful and actually has been used uh, in late cases, uh, be it about Shell or Exxon, or be it about um, the, 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 the case of climate justice or climate law. And that is that if you look the crimes against humanity, it doesn't define that you have to kill people with knives. And the, uh, the governments and the legal system and the whole global system has a direct or indirect liability to protect. And so if you fail with this liability to protect, be it uh, urban air quality, and uh, uh, that is the biggest uh, 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 take of the death tolls in the euro, it is a mass murder. The weapons are just different. And I think that this sort of a uh, uh, thing uh, binds up at the next ambition level with the, uh, with the um, sort of the core principle of it all, oh, who's you have the right for good environment, you have the right to know about it. You, uh, you should have an environmental impact on, on what you do. And uh, there's the limits on, on destructions. Okay, so I guess that we need to be doing a lot of courtroom acti uh, activism to in, in forward and maybe this will impact the Aarhus. But then uh, let's go back to the Aarhus and the massive frustrations what the Parliament, the European Parliament has had it where also what we heard and uh, especially Marcelina had very good, um, uh, very good points on, on this. And firstly, uh, it is totally a failed uh, uh, approach 
to have the reference on individual acts, point one and point two, about the reference to implementation measures. And actually this is uh, uh, commissions, this kind of a circular uh, uh, argumentation telling, okay, yes, we comply, but actually we don't comply because they need to comply and they don't comply because then again, you know, it is just the implementation of the European uh, uh, regulation. And to me, one this kind of a theoretical question is, isn't this against of the rule of the law? Isn't it against sort of uh, 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 doing that kind of actions that actually distort the origin of international convention and the action. And could we have someone to try to uh, raise a case against commission about this? Because uh, I'll conclude then when I conclude with the point, how to challenge and what to challenge. And that was what we heard just before uh, my intervention. And I think that these sort of a challenging acts with good lawyers should be done nationally. They should be done directly towards the commission and we should uh, uh, see what we can do with the European uh, 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 Court of Justice. Uh, justice. Uh, it might be a more difficult to challenge the interpretations uh, to be unlawful, that I think that they, when they washed hands, actually, they did that. And can, could we do it in international circus or in international sort of uh, interpretation of the convention? And we have to remember what was the UN's reaction on the use uh, commission original plans to uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to to work with those convention. And yes, there are three or four points and I just would like to for your work clarify what problems we have in concrete level. Soft law, that is a major part of the actions. And now if you can't have background about biodiversity strategy, or its implementation guidelines. And we are far from having a biodiversity legislation. So it would fall in soft law and such a major thing. Who could uh, seek the information? Who could seek uh, the background papers? Then it is the research in general. And uh, that is a bit twofold uh, point. I understand that you couldn't sort of a, let uh, leave uh, in quotes all lunatics to uh, harass commission with all the impact assessments. Uh, but this is a bit far-fetched position because that was basically why the commission member states don't want to have the access to background research. Uh, but the real reason is that I remember that, for example, when we are talking about uh, uh, the uh, TARS and then whether that could be imported to you or not, that was a couple of years ago. The commission did three impact assessments because the two uh, first ones failed to, to, to give a positive, uh, positive answer to a commission that this is sustainable and could be imported to you. And this is totally out of the sort of a procedure that commission can sort of uh, I would almost call it falsify the results by looking uh, and recruiting the, the, the impact assessment makers so long that they get the answer what they want. Second, for example, is the okay, uh, famous case of Monsanto, but we have a lot of them. Uh, so there's the case that uh, there's the scientific proof and uh, international WHO scientific proof about pesticides and uh, they impact. But suddenly there's the new research that is only referred as a research that shows uh, the agencies that this is completely safe. You can't access the research, you can't access uh, who financed that, but then yes, it has implications because on based on this uh, uh, verification of the agency, uh, actually, the commission is interpreting, uh, interpreting that, yes, you should continue using nicotinides and uh, Monsanto products. And voila, after a while, you notice that it, it was financed by Monsanto, the whole study, and actually didn't have anything else. This is outrageous. And actually, the access to information should be and is the basis that you would have 
already in the initial stage, an EU famous for its transparency, at least nominally, the access to information on impact assessments, on research, on programming, on work programs, on different agencies' background research, so they couldn't be uh, legitimate reasons to, 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 to close them down. And then not only in, in narrow environment uh, concept, but also if you have an energy strategy that has climate uh, implication, it might have a biodiversity implication. So or our, let's say, 10 uh, program for roads and railroads might have a biodiversity impact. So that sort of a background preparations should be uh, 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 open for information with uh, justified uh, requests. And uh, this sort of, to have, uh, have that in, in, in general scope and open to all, that is duly in line with OHU's uh, regulation and its spirit and what the commission is doing, and especially with the council, what they are doing. It is totally against it. And to me, the big wonder is how you can act accordingly if that really isn't sort of a legal basis ex uh, uh, acceptable. And there I conclude, this is the sort of the, the, the challenging, challenging point. Maybe you could try the treaty change, but uh, I, I, I can't foresee it happening. So I think that uh, it should happen by the legal, uh, legal uh, interpretations. And let's it, uh, then conclude with the plain assessment. Uh, remember, this is not truth, it is just assessment. Well, that, why then do the commission act like this and the member states? It is the old fashioned industry strategy, energy strategy point of view. Do not come and miss our uh, uh, growth uh, and national interest, be it forests or gas or, or uh, uh, whatever coal. Do not mess up with our sort of a serious economic interests. And uh, then basically it is the fear uh, that, that pushes the commission and especially the member states uh, to, to use this kind of a behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very insightful and, and excellent combination with the presentations. We, I look forward to continue in the discussion from these teams too. But before that, let us give the floor to Sebastian, who takes us now to the international level and discusses the role of the Aarhus Convention there. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking on a panel with such distinguished experts. And I'm particularly pleased to be invited by my alma, alma mater, sorry, uh, University of Helsinki, because I think that Eric uh, Castren's team has a lot uh, to be blamed for for me taking an international legal path. Uh, so, so thank you for all of the past inspiration. Um, I'll be speaking briefly about um, international, the international component of the OWUS Convention. And um, I had not planned to, to do a presentation, but then um, seeing how the, the morning started, I just put together a few slides to also prevent you from having to go through my uh, French pronunciation of um, more well-known um, saying. So let me start uh, here. I will try also to be a little bit brief so we have more, um, more chance for a discussion. I just wanted to come back actually to the, the first uh, very inspiring actually presentation uh, by Emily this morning, really that highlighted how actually the August Convention has the potential of being this shining light um, that really projects beyond the three um, core obligations or, or rights uh, actually so many other values and um, how it was a transformational instrument when it was adopted and it still has the power of, of do, being so if only parties will really not only uh, work to implement their obligations but actually take pride in this. And um, since Emily started biblical this morning, I, I thought I'd come back to, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, this very brief citation that many of you will recognize from a text we're not necessarily citing so often in international legal um, presentations, but no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but understands that those who come in 
may see the light. And that's really the purpose of Article 3.7 of the OHRUS Convention, is actually to promote the principles of the OHRUS Convention in international forums. So I'm going to speak a little bit more about this, this particular obligation. And I want to stress, I'm not saying this particular provision, but obligation, because uh, since this is a treaty drafted in the era of optimism at the end of the 90s, we see language that we'll probably not be able to see nowadays, unfortunately. And that is a lot more ambitious, actually, than what you can find in the Escazo agreement when it comes to this particular dimension. Um, and so here is Article 3.7. Having spent too much time in international climate negotiations, the, the first thing that really inspires me is the verb there. There is no doubt this is not about what parties might do, what party could do, what party um, might uh, consider when time uh, allows, but really, according to the OHRUS Convention, Article 3.7, parties shall promote the application of the principle of this convention in international environmental decision-making processes. And within the framework of international organizations in matters relating to the environment. So not only actually core multilateral environmental agreements, but actually any international process that relates to the, the environment. The two key for me in, in this beautifully worded provision are actually the two verbs. There is no question that this is an obligation. Shall is very explicit in here. And the obligation is not to take into consideration or to keep in mind, as we might see now in more recent instruments, but it is to promote. And um, I think according to the, the common language, uh, the common uh, English definition of the, the term, this re really requires a proactive engagement to promote those principles. Um, and so this has a very important um, role to play actually in bringing the uh, OROS uh, principles and obligation in relevant international instruments, and there are many of them actually beyond just the, the traditional MES that we can think of, but both in order to make sure that those instruments actually do not undermine the rights protected under the convention, but also to, to try to project and um, inspire uh, the, the protection of those rights in other countries beyond the UNEC region. And there it's important to remember that there is another very inspiring provision that is actually um, will be um, used for the first time uh, at the MOP of the OHRUS Convention later this autumn. It is the ability for non-UNEC parties also to ratify the OHRUS Convention. And we look forward to welcoming Guinea-Bissau as the first African state to ratify the OHRUS Convention this autumn, uh, highlighting how this is not just about European principles. But to come back to Article 3.7, this is very strong language. And actually, it has been further developed over the years, including by a, a MOP decision um, that is in two, adopted in 2004, the Almaty guidelines. And I just wanted to uh, share this is one of the last citation, I promise. But um, it highlights actually what is meant there by promoting public participation in international forums. And it's really actually this provision helps us understand why we are speaking here about a right-based approach when it comes to promoting the right of the public to engage in international environmental forums. It speaks about the fact that modalities must be in place to counterbalance existing imbalances in, in political and economic influence, uh, taking into consideration the differentiated capacity, resources, and social cultural circumstances. And the fact also that actually modalities must be put in place to minimize inequality and avoid the exercise of undue economic and political influence very much rooted in the context of a non-discriminatory uh, and human rights um, context. At the same time, uh, we see that um, this is not necessarily um, first in place or established under relevant MES, very far from it, I would say, but also that the role of the OHUS parties in actually bringing international environmental processes in line with these provisions that they themselves adopted is um, to say the least, um, relatively shy and, and um, passive. At the moment, we are seeing actually two international processes, one um, taking place today. There is the annual meeting of a working group of parties to the OHRUS Convention taking place virtually in Geneva. And then we have a UNFCCC negotiation taking place virtually around um, Bonn. And we see there, it's really a tale of two cities where actually we see very different modalities applied and uh, it brings civil society advocates sometimes in despair because of the challenges of actively engaging in the UNFC process. And so uh, let me turn now to, to where um, 
August parties should really take this Article 3.7 and actually promote it, promote those principles of the host convention proactively in the context of the climate negotiations. I'll turn off the presentation just because I'm missing face-to-face -face interaction in these COVID times. But the Article 3.7 is supposed to apply in the context of climate negotiations and the implementation of the Paris Agreement at different levels. So the first one, of course, it's in the modalities of a negotiation. That's all of this um, frustration that civil society expressed about not being able to participate, not being able to um, observe um, negotiations and actually lacking grievance mechanisms when those would be required, actually. Um, there, there is a lot of progress that the uh, UNFCCC process could actually do to make sure that the implementation, the discussion about the implementation of the Paris Agreement at the international level actually reflect this vision of environmental democracy, reflects both the Aarhus Convention, but actually the modalities of the Paris Agreement that recognize the value of access to information and public participation in the preamble, in Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, in Article 6 of the UNFCCC. Um, there are a lot of challenges there, and I can tell you the first time that I, as a young delegate, came back from the climate negotiations and engaged in the Aarhus Convention, I was shocked to see a microphone standing on the table in front of me and people encouraging me to, to take the floor and intervene in the process, because at the UNFCCC, as uh, many of you might know, the, the main way that civil society can interact actually effectively in the negotiations is by having a short three minute statement at the beginning of a two weeks negotiation. And then again at the end, which makes any interactions and really like pro provision of expertise and perspectives um, very challenging. The second point is also we see in the UNFCCC, but in many other UN instruments, a shift away from the principles of participation because of environmental democracy for the sake of the right to participate towards a recognition actually of the value and the legitimacy of voices because of their capacity to take action. And there we see a shift basically away from recognizing the role and the rights of communities and representatives of indigenous peoples and civil society to really participate in decisions that will affect them to a growing recognition that it's very important to have local governments, the business and civil society, particularly those who actually take climate action um, because they can actually share their own experience and they are contributing to climate action. But this is not a right-based framework. This is a very different set of um, understanding of why do we engage in multi-stakeholder partnerships and without discarding the importance of taking into consideration the valuable inputs by the business sector, it's very important to remember that from a rights-based perspective of an environmental democracy perspective, um, we should really not put on equal footing businesses that benefit from certain schemes and indigenous peoples who see their rights impacted by those same schemes. Uh, and this is something that the UNFC is increasingly uh, challenged actually to acknowledge. Another key element in terms of a promotion of those Aarhus principles in the context of the UNFC, where we also would really like to see um, the EU, but also Aarhus parties uh, actually really taking leadership, is the promotion of the Aarhus principles in substantive outcomes that are decided in the context of the Paris Agreement. Um, there is a work program, for instance, on action for climate empowerment that relates to access to information and public participation in the context of the Paris Agreement. And it's really uh, challenging for us to understand why is it so difficult for Norway, Switzerland, other European Union to really take up the language of right-based access to information and uh, right-based public participation, since this is not just recognized in the host convention, but also for principle 10 and so many other instruments. And so this is one example where we we do not see any, like, it's very difficult to see how Aarhus parties actually promote the Aarhus principles as is required on Article 3.7. Maybe more alarming is the issue related to carbon trading, where we know from past experiences under the Kyoto Cold Protocol, yeah. we know from past experiences under the Kyoto Protocol that carbon trading mechanisms um, regulated at the international level can provide an incentives for projects that actually lead to harms in local communities that would not have taken place otherwise. And there it is critical to make sure that those communities that might be impacted have access to effective grievance mechanisms, have actually their right to public participation fully and effectively respected, because otherwise it is not only that the UN process is turning a blind eye on those violations, but it actually provides new incentives 
that actually increases the risk of human rights threats for those communities. And um, this is very relevant um, for the discussions that we are seeing this year, trying to finalize rules for the Paris Agreement rulebook in relation to Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, those new sustainable development mechanisms and other processes. And there again, um, it's been a, a very long process to get the European Union delegates to actually speak up for the importance of grievance mechanisms, as would be the case in any other international financial instruments, for instance. And uh, too often have we heard European delegates tell us, we will not speak against uh, those principles. If other parties propose, we, we will agree to them. But this, for us, it, it's very far from the concept of shall promote that is reflected in Article 3.7. I'll need to wrap up um, very soon. So just let me highlight a final point actually that's critical before I conclude. It's the role of a host, host country. The role of a host country in hosting an annual COP or any other international environmental agreement is critical for different reasons. First, because it sets the tone and really actually empower all these empowered civil society to take this to take part effectively to the proceedings, but also because other non-European countries are watching, or even European countries are watching what European uh, so-called environmental democracy leaders are doing. And we are right now in a world where civil society space is shrinking and environmental leaders face threats to their life. We should not take those things um, lightly. And so for us, it is very challenging to see host country, uh, European states hosting annual climate conferences actually bridge not only Article 3.7 by not promoting those principles, but actually infringe the rights of uh, public participation, the rights of environmental advocates to participate in decision making as protected under the OAS Convention. This has been the case in Copenhagen in 2009. It has been the case to some extent in Paris in 2015. And it was the case uh, in Katowice to a level where actually several UN agencies intervened because of uh, a sweeping ban on demo demonstration and actually the um, the arrest and deportation of environmental activists without any information being provided as to why they were deported. It is only a matter of time before Article 3.7 will be um, assessed by the, the Compliance Committee and a European country will have to respond for its uh, failure to actually protect those rights in the context of international negotiations. To, to turn and to conclude with a forward-looking um, view, we really hope that all parties, now that Eskezu has also entered into force, really not only work proactively to, to promote policy coherence, but actually stand proud of this very important legacy that they have developed at the regional level and really promote proactively those principles in the context of the climate negotiations. And there, of course, the UK will have a tremendous uh, role, but also actually all of the OUS parties when they negotiate critical matters such as Article 6. And in that context, to, to come back um, to, to Helsinki, it's very encouraging to see that Finland is placing human rights and climate change at the core of its candidacy to the Human Rights Council. And so we really hope that the Finnish delegates actually in the context of a climate negotiation live up to those commitments because we will be monitoring both processes um, adequately. And too often have we heard very ambitious or um, proactive European delegates tell us that they wish they could actually promote those principles, but unfortunately behind the veil of a European delegation, some other unnamed European member states are not promoting those principles. And this, princi this concept of EU coordination in itself is also a very strong bridge in uh, access to, to information in terms of understanding where individual parties actually stand on those principles and being able to hold them accountable. So I'm just hoping that in the next two weeks as climate negotiations virtually wrap up, we will be able to see that um, I was wrong in claiming that uh, all those parties tend to forget about the principles uh, that are contained in the convention and Article 3.7 in particular. Thank you, Sebastian. That was really very interesting. And thank you also for keeping with the time. It was exactly 15 minutes. Now I give the floor to Haro for his response before the discussion together. Right, thanks, Tina, and uh, thanks especially to Sebastien, who's, uh, I would say, probably the, the world leading expert on the issue of Article 3.7, uh, at least in the context of, of the climate negotiations. Um, 
so of, obviously the Irish parties have a very, very important role to play uh, in ensuring that the Irish principles and provisions are promoted in international forums, such as the UNFCCC. Uh, and now, of course, we also have uh, the new kid on the block with the, the Escazú agreement, and hopefully other parties in the Latin American and Caribbean region also joining, uh, joining in these efforts. But at the same time, Sebastian was alre already pointing out is that uh, also already within the Irish parties, more could be done and more should be done to actually live up to these uh, these obligations under, under Article 3.7. Now, not wishing to repeat uh, some of the points he mentioned or exceed my five minutes, I just wanted to briefly touch upon three areas which I think require further attention. Um, the first is when we're thinking about the climate change negotiations, we're often thinking about the, the plenary halls where all the governments come together and make their important decisions. Um, I think what we see increasingly, and, and climate negotiations is one example, I'm sure other negotiations will be similar, is we have a fragmentation of different bodies where decisions are either being made or being prepared. So if you look at the number of constituents uh, to the bodies in, in the climate negotiations, we see really proliferation, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, just to name a few, we have an adaptation committee, uh, a technology, uh, technology executive committee, we have a Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, uh, a committee on uh, executive committee on loss and damage, and you, the list goes on. And in each of these committees, important discussions are being held, important decisions can be prepared or made. And it's also important to make sure that in each of these committees, the Irish principles and provisions are being lived up to. So one of my uh, UEF colleagues uh, uh, who has been involved in the negotiations from a very practical perspective with his NGO, uh, Mr. Adrian Martinez Blanco, has recently done some analysis of, these, uh, of the rules of procedure, so the procedural regulations of these different bodies, basically finding that the, the rules of procedure and other regulations are very inconsistent among each other. So there will be some, uh, some of these bodies which will have, let's say, relatively decent or good practice when it comes to implementing the Irish provisions and others basically, uh, well, ignoring them or, or not really uh, implementing them that, that well. So some will allow uh, or some will tell observers and NGOs when they will have the meeting, what their meetings will be about, uh, where their meetings will be, and others do not even provide for that. So. The first point of attention then, I think, is that when we're talking about implementing Article 3.7, we need to do it across the board. So we need to make sure that it's not just about the rules of procedure for the UNFCCC in general and the practices, not just the, the, the written procedures, um, but also make sure that uh, the decisions are not just being delegated to other bodies and still uh, making uh, the life of NGOs and other observers difficult. So that's the first point. Then the second uh, point that I want to make is that we're looking, uh, in this case, at Article 3.7 and the, uh, the international climate negotiations, but very important things are also happening at the national level. Um, and I'm thinking particularly here at what the Paris Agreement introduced uh, with its five yearly nationally determined contributions or NDCs. And these need, NDCs need to be prepared and impl implemented, of course, at the national level. Now, what we've seen in the first round of NDCs in 2014, 2015, and what we're seeing now also with the updates and revisions of NDCs in 2020 and, and, and this year, is that maybe some countries are actually taking uh, um, public consultation seriously, but these parties are in the minority. And including with, with the Irish parts and including uh, the EU when it prepared its, its NDC, what we see is so far very limited uh, public consultation about what this NDC actually should contain. So the EU follows its regular process, of course, of, of, uh, of decision making, uh, but we do not have a broader European debate about what the NDC should, uh, should be about and what it should be, be including. So also here, it's important to pay attention, not just what happens in the international negotiations, but also what happens with the decision making process in the capitals at the national level or in the UK, the EU level um, in the preparation for these meetings. So that's the second uh, uh, point I want to, to throw out. And then the final point, um, and which uh, already was alluded to by Sebastien, um, this is not just about when we're going back to the international level, this is not just about the international climate change negotiations. The Arus Convention um, and particularly the Almaty guidelines are quite broad in what it's talking about, so international forums. And we increasingly know that important decisions on climate change are not just being made at the UNFCCC. 
We have under the International Civil Aviation Organization, we have all kinds of decisions being made about how to address aviation emissions. Likewise, International Maritime Organization making decisions about maritime emissions. G20, G7, very important high level uh, uh, decisions being made about all kinds of things, about climate finance, about fossil fuel subsidies, you name it. So all of these forums are in principle covered by the by uh, by the Iris Convention, and at least the Iris parties are under an obligation to promote the principles of the convention also in these forums. But if you look at these forums, then the UNFCCC is actually not that bad. Even uh, though I understand Sebastian's complaints and 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 his and his issues, if you look at uh, forums like the the Civil Aviation Organization or the Maritime Organization, they are much more secretive. They are much more closed to observers and and NGOs. Um, so if we want to pay attention to, to relevant decision making at the international level, I think we should also increasingly turn an eye to these other important forums outside of the UNFCCC. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Helen. I think then it's time to move to the Q&A session. And I've uh, recorded, I've written down all the questions that have appeared on the screen so far. I have, uh, let's say, three general questions, then a few speaker-specific uh, questions. Um, and I know that at least Marjolina is under time, some time constraints. So what I propose to do simply is that I will throw all of these questions at you. and. Uh, uh, you may have then a few minutes to answer them. You can also be selective, so choose the ones that feel that concern you or where you want to add something that you've said before. And I also mention if there is a sort of personal question to somebody in particular. And then uh, maybe Marilina can begin and then we uh, advance after that advanced in the same order uh, as you spoke earlier. So the first general question would be that it Based on the discussions today, of course, we can all see that there is a, a very big contradiction between the ambitions of the Aarhus Convention and the EU regulation. And uh, there is a question now for your reactions as to why. <laughs> why is the EU so reluctant? Um, and are there too, too few people basically fighting for the Aarhus Convention and the rights included there? That's the first general question. The second general question concerns the proposals for uh, a new European climate law. Do you see that um, this would improve access to justice, um, EU level, national level, uh, and perhaps also a specific question uh, concerning the parliament's position on that? And then the final general question, which was actually addressed to all of you, but also to Marialina in particular, uh, concerns the reform of the Aarhus regulation and, and what you think in particular that should be uh, improved there. What's the problem? Then I have. Um, three questions uh, addressed to uh, uh, an individual speaker. First, Emily, there's a question about uh, your point of environmental substantive rights um, and whether that influences um, basically the scope and the aim of the convention and whether other substantive rights are affected, um, by, affected by climate change should and might uh, influence uh, the Aarhus Convention Trinity that you discussed in your, uh, in your talk. Um, then I think I, I would have a question to Anne uh, in, in particular. Um, as a civil society representative, I mean, we've heard a lot of depressing stories today about how the Aarhus Convention and how they are in the EU in particular fails to deliver. Do you see that or who's ever have uh, has any added, added value in the EU? Does it ever help to deliver uh, anything in the EU? Very basic question. And finally, uh, Jana, there is a question for you concerning uh, the court's interpretation in Sabo and uh, how you like how you think that is consistent uh, with the victim requirements uh, in the uh, jurisprudence of the European. Uh, court on Human Rights. So first to Marjolina, and then in the same order as before, you have a few minutes uh, to highlight or respond, and, and also feel free to be a bit selective. 
Thank you very much, uh, Paivi. And uh, well, the questions that I have been uh, given are all difficult ones, actually. So um, I start from uh, the, the why question, which is possibly the hardest because, uh, yeah, also as lawyer, I always have troubles with this why question because, uh, yeah, I am not so much in the mind of neither of the lawmaker nor of the court. Um, the, the explanation that I find is really this in a way, path dependency. Uh, there is a sense of, 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 of fear, of uh, scare, that if uh, something radical takes place, uh, it will open the floodgates of litigation, um, it will fundamentally reshape the way remedies uh, look like. Um, yeah, the, the court has been, for example, very clear um, that uh, if, if we want to change Plowman, uh, then we, it's, it's for the member states to do that. It's for the masters of the treaty, which is of course a joke because individual concern is written in the treaty, not Plowman. What the, 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 the interpretation of individual concern is for the court to give. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it's always, I think, the scare that structural changes uh, should come from the member states so that they are then kind of adequately legitimized in, in, in that sense. So that's kind of the explanation um, in a way, non-scientific explanation that I can give to uh, to, to this attitude, um, and it's becoming more and more entrenched. That's the point. That because we've had Plowman since since the 60s, um, so the, the longer it stays, the harder it becomes to 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 change it. And the same goes for you know the Aros regulation and this kind of structural changes on the directive on Article 93 and so on. And what needs to change now in the in respect of the Arus regulation, um, I think at least uh, two things uh, to um, to be able to uh, bring uh, internal review claims against measures of soft law. I think also Sirpa uh, mentioned this uh, before, how important this would be in certain specific uh, environmental climate change sub policy fields, um, which are very rich in, in soft law with with strong legal effects. Um, and second, uh, that also measures of general scope would be um, uh, challenged, which even if they require implementing measures, because the moment there is an implementing measures, it may be already too late. And the moment the question of validity reaches the court of justice, well, good luck. I mean, the environmental damage is done and gone. And, you know, the trees are destroyed, the, the animals are gone and everything else with it, let's say. And again, uh, you know, there are, of course, interim measures at national level. But again, they vary. They are based on the willingness of the court of justice. There are a Duque Fabric requirements which need to be complied with when you send a preliminary question on validity. So there is so many hurdles and so many kind of, you know, little little boxes that you need to kind of move around that becomes, um, yeah, so much of a, of, a, of a challenge that it almost like someone is rowing against you. Like the, the flaw, uh, you, as, a, as an NGO, you need, need to walk up or, or uh, um, swim up, up the flow like a salmon, let's say, to be able to get to where you want to go. Um, and... Um, yeah, so, and that, that did, this would be my, uh, my two uh, answers. Then to Emily. Um, <clears throat> so an answer to why uh, the Aarhus Convention is not as um, implemented as it should be. Uh, and I've been thinking mostly about this question all through the various presentations. Um, and I think partly the problem is that we forget the vision of the Aarhus Convention. Many of us are lawyers and we talk in terms of lawyers. And if we talk at, kind of talk in the language of lawyers and if we think exclusively about the procedural rights, there's just nothing, there's nothing sexy about that. Um, but there is something very intriguing and exciting about what the convention actually wants to do. And I think we haven't necessarily been so good at communicating that. Uh, and for those of us who are very familiar with that, ambitious, wonderful vision, we can forget it. Um, and I, I kind of say in the beginning of my book about the, my, my relationship to the Aarhus Convention being a love story. I think there is something really profoundly intriguing about the Aarhus Convention, but I think when we're in love, we can often forget why we are in love. Um, and I think maybe there's been a little bit of that. Um, and then it's also, if we look to Latin America and the Caribbean and we see um, the Escazú, Oh, did I? Oh, <laughs> if we see the, the Eskazu agreement, we can remind ourselves of what an ambitious vision looks like and how exciting 
that can be because Eskazu is even more unabashed um, in its vision than the Aarhus Convention. Um, so I suppose the problem is that we've forgotten a little. And I think the solution um, is that uh, to have a look at Eskazu and, and be reunited um, in what, what it is we, we're trying to do. Uh, <laughs> and, and then in answer to Joanna's question, which is a little tricky, um, about substantive rights and the Aarhus Convention. Um, I think the, the, the role of substantive rights in Aarhus is kind of, there's a twofold role. Um, I think one, uh, the Aarhus Convention is part of a, a broader international dialogue that is building a narrative about environmental rights in international law. So if we accept that, I'm so sorry, if we accept that um, human rights are not just things that come into existence because they're in a, they, they find themselves in a treaty, but they grow as part of a, an international legal order, we can see that the Aarhus Convention in Article 1 is a stepping stone in that development. Um, so I think there's, there's that role that the Aarhus Convention plays in terms of substantive environmental rights. And then the second is that I think it's kind of a light switch. So it, it plays a role in building the, this um, narrative of environment, substantive environmental rights, but it is also there waiting, waiting for the international legal order to say, go, yes, um, we recognize substantive environmental rights and so it switches on. I think that's the kind of this um, ambiguous language in Article 1, this in order to contribute to the right of, um, I think that's what that is. It's kind of a trigger um, and once we do have that um, more general recognition, I think then it can be very powerful um, in how it influences the other rights. Um, thank you. I, I will stop there otherwise. Yes. <laughs> Okay, then I think Anne is next. Um, I'm getting messages that my internet is unstable. So if you can't hear me, then hold up your hands and I'll put a bunch of stuff in the chat that you can read at your own leisure. <laughs> um, so first, I think I just want to quickly uh, touch on the why because I've been working, been advocating for on in this process a lot with decision makers. So um, I, I think, um, to be honest, I think a lot of the problems come down to the lawyers. Um, and I think that I've noticed that there's a lot of political will across the, the deputies of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the European Parliament to bring the EU into alignment. When you talk to the member states, again, there's quite a lot of political willingness to say, yes, we signed up to Aarhus, we want to comply. They had a terrible time at the last mop. They don't, you know, I think they were quite scarred by that. It, it, was, it was quite a traumatic um, situation. Um, but then they say, but there's so much detail we don't really understand all the detail what to do. And then the lawyers come in and they carve out these exceptions that just um, you know, ruin the whole thing. So I, I really think that a lot of it comes down to the lawyers and indeed how we talk about it is, as well and how we communicate about it is, is, um, it is kind of all mashed up in that. Um, so I think that we need to be a lot clearer that it's very, very clear what has to be done is that any EU administrative act that has, that could possibly contravene environmental law needs to come within the internal review procedure and that, you know, that full stop after that, none of these carve outs. Um, um, then I, I, I definitely have a lot of ideas of what needs to be done to make the Aarhus regulation fit for purpose. And I've got, we've got position papers, so I'm just going to put them in the chat. And of course, the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee also has, has gone into a lot of detail as to what has to be done. And um, so that's all there. And I'll put the links in, in the chat in a second. Um, on the climate law, I also worked quite a bit on this, on the access to justice provision and the climate law. Um, I think that it, it's it's a terrible shame that that didn't make it through the trilogue. It would have really codified essentially a lot of the access to justice rights that are should already exist, that they're there in the case law of the court. There's already access to justice for your quality plans, etc. This should be the same in terms of the national energy and climate plans and the long term strategies that are in the in, in the in the energy governance regulation, because that was that was all, all about really it was having access to justice to challenge these national plans so I'll um, I'll also put a position paper in the chat on that and then finally 
does um, the artist convention ever uh, add value at EU, at EU level? Um, so uh, two things I'm just going to talk about briefly. I think, first of all, an access to environmental information. Um, and I'm just going to mention um, one of my favorite cases on access to environmental information. And it reminds me of what Emily said at the beginning about um, at, uh, industry at, um, requesting access to information, because this case was all about when saint uh, requested access to information. And it had a very, actually, um, a very positive outcome. And it's a case that I rely on very, very frequently in my interactions on, on transparency with EU institutions. And there, um, really, we saw, particularly the Advocate General, really go back to the Aarhus Convention and interpret Regulation 1049 in the light of the Aarhus Convention with very positive outcomes, and um, really narrowing down this decision-making um, exception, this exception that protects decision-making in Regulation 1049. And the court um, kind of drew back a bit in terms of really relying on Aarhus, but it kept the, the logic of the, of the Advocate General's opinion, and that was very positive. Um, and then secondly, on the Aarhus regulation, um, it's true that Marilena says at the beginning, it's completely, uh, it's just a, what was it, a complete failure. And yes, it is to a large extent, I agree. But we have actually managed to use it in these um, uh, chemicals decisions. And, and also, we've also, we're also using it in a pending case um, to challenge a financing decision of the EIB. And these are really cases where we would never have any, any redress against the institutions and where we've actually made some progress in getting the court uh, particularly to really look at these decisions of the, of, the, of, the, of the commission and of the EIB and start to think about whether they really comply with environmental law. So that I think um, for me shows that the Aarhus regulation can work, it can play a role um, and that we just need to, we need to get it over the finishing line now in terms of opening it up so that we can really use it. And I'll leave it there and I'll put these links in the chat that I've spoken about. Thank you, Anne. Uh, now I'm looking in the direction of Sebastian, who I've just learned needs to go as well. Uh, do you have time to take the floor for two minutes before you go? Absolutely, and I can be very brief because most of the questions are more targeted perhaps to some of the other presentations. Um, I do think it would be very useful in the context of when we discuss the the hard implications, the legal implications of ORUS domestically to, to try to see there are opportunities to, to think about what this means also in the context of how the EU behaves in international forums, what kind of actually positions of the EU should be exposed to a little bit more transparency, uh, for instance, because this issue of a, a European Union veil actually preventing understanding of how positions are shaped, not just the national determined contribution as how mentioned, but also the, the positions that are adopted in the context of various environmental negotiations is something that really hinder actually the, the effective enjoyment of the rights that are protected under the convention. And I would just uh, like to maybe reiterate what Emily said about like, advocates failing to explain, uh, you know, to, to a broader uh, community why this instrument is so transformational. When we speak to climate decision makers, they are very focused on delivering ambition and often for them it's mitigation ambition. And for them, it's, they are under tremendous pressure because they understand the gap between what they are politically able to deliver and what actually is necessary. And I think it really means that they are trying to clear the road of any potential obstacles that they perceive. And we are doing a bad job at explaining why environmental democracy is not only important from the point of view of individual rights to, take, to participate in decision-making and democracy, but also for effective uh, climate action. And so I would just paste a beautiful quote from the IPCC at rep special report on 1.5 that says it all, um, that describe how actually civil society is really critical to delivering those transformational changes. And I think we just, all of us really need to do a better job at speaking the other's language and reaching out to environmental decision makers from a right-based perspective, but also highlighting how this is beneficial for them because it will provide them the mandate to do it, to deliver those very uh, ambitious and transformational policies that we need. Um, so I just paste the, the quotes uh, in the chat and thank you so much for having me today. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, then we go to Cyprus next. Thanks to uh, talk about, but I'll, I think I'll focus on two. Um, just starting to the why question, I completely agree with Marjolina and this idea of the path dependency. To that, maybe I would add that there is an issue of individual 
of internal EU law with international law. And I think there is um, so we don't want to touch the autonomy of the EU legal order. We don't get we don't accept outsiders coming to tell us that the complete system of remedies is not working. They don't understand how it's meant to work. I think the Commission's initial reaction uh, to the ACC findings was this is a unique legal order that the ACC is not getting, and they completely ignored the preliminary reference procedure, even though they hadn't, and they explained why it wouldn't provide the answer. Um, so I think there is that to the why. It's not, again, it's not a very legal argument, but I think this idea of autonomy of the legal order is part of um, of the of the understanding, at least from my perspective, of the why. Now, coming to, uh, I think it was Annalisa who asked about um, the interpretation of individual concern on the basis of fundamental rights and how it differentiates from the European Court of Human Rights. Well, when I was writing the first draft of the paper, the ECJ hadn't, the Court of Justice had not come out uh, with the decision. So I was presenting it as a novel opportunity to change individual concern interpretation particularly in environmental cases. Um, the disappointing thing is that it's not even a weak approach by the court, it just doesn't engage with the rights, it doesn't even engage with the individual different rights that the applicants raise. Um, it, both the general court and the court of justice said, even if the fundamental rights are infringed, change individual consent. So it's a very different approach from what the European Court of Human Rights in the victim status is looking for. Because here it says, even if the fundamental rights are infringed and we are recognizing that they're higher ranking rules, and shaded individually as the, uh, the, as the addressee. So it's that there were many arguments that the applicants raised in relation to fundamental rights and the court just didn't engage with them. So it, it just, of changing individual consent interpretation um, on this basis. Put on the European climate law, and Anne could possibly uh, correct me if um, I'm getting something wrong. The access to justice provision, especially in the EU climate law, I think is disappointing, but supposedly in light of the court's case law, at least at the national level, that shouldn't make a difference because the court has said, you know, you should interpret national provisions or set them aside if they can't guarantee access to justice. So I think this is where also to try to end on a positive note, the treaty revision is unrealistic. So I try and make the existing remedies work. And I think this is where the commission has a role to play, particularly in following up with member states that are restricting access to national courts. It says it will do it, in its latest communication it says I'm watching what's happening at the national level, but it's not actually doing anything. It knows about member states that are restricting access proceedings against those member states. I don't even think we have any sort of informal uh, uh, situation there. I'm talking to the people in Cyprus, they didn't even know that they were violating the Aarhus Convention or the requirements of the Court of Justice. The Department of Environment said, but we have uh, access to justice for Article 9.2. They don't even understand Article 9.3 is about general access to justice. So we also need to be really to, to also communicate that more clearly, I guess, in that sense. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this webinar, which I very much enjoyed. Thank you very much. And then I will give the floor to Silva before I try to wrap up this uh, rich discussion in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll try to be extra brief because of the timing. Firstly, about the climate law. <clears throat> yes, I, uh, uh, I agree that it was a pity that this stronger civil society participation was not part of the uh, trilogue's outcome. But what we would need to take in, uh, care of now is that uh, this uh, solution would not uh, be interpreted in member states and in the Commission a contrario. So that uh, now when it was not taken into a port, it means uh, you do not need to, uh, need to do it. But that the reference to all whose principles and uh, transparency and, and the all EU other reg uh, regulations take care of this. 
Then uh, the second point, just uh, a, a sort of a, a short notice, what I'm expecting uh, to happen is this, this kind of a lit a litigation uh, process is what we have in climate on biodiversity side as well. And I'm sort of a strong um, uh, person to, to believe on, on this kind of a courtroom activism instead of a chasing legislation. In theory, try to chase the legislation, but uh, with this existing political climate, this probably only is too slow a uh, uh, route. And so we would need to take the another one uh, to be hand in hand. And then the last, uh, why the commission and politicians are so hesitant, I think answered by the commission and member state, they just don't want to too much of the inter interference in the economic procedures, partly. And then the next part is, and this is in the parliament as well, for us that are strong supporters, because it gets, gets very complicated to me too, and I guess I have some background in environmental legislation and EU legislation. And then when you talk with those people who explain why you can't do it, it's filled with uh, uh, legal uh, filigration up to the amount that you really need to be a specialist to understand all these sort of uh, justifications and uh, uh, circular agreements and references to EU court decision and whatever. And it sometimes feels a bit of a more purposeful way of trying to imitate uh, the, the uh, listener that, wow, legally impossible. Yes, I did get the point. And uh, this has been just a word of warning for you too. This, uh, on my understanding, has been the tendency from the council and uh, commission side to increase this in uh, environmental fora in all the other forests too. So you feel just with that kind of filigration that no one can be actually uh, certain of what it means and how to follow up and how to uh, counter, uh, uh, counter fight that. And last but not least, this is exactly why we need this kind of a context and thank great thanks for client earth already for the help what we have had in the European Parliament and in, but in the future too, because if you are shadow hidden by the league, legalities, then you would need to be able to, to, to counterweight it and to, 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 to counteract with the, uh, other justifications. And this we as a politicians can do and can't be creative without your help. So thank you and all the best success for your work. Thank you very much for that uh, summing up. Now comes the time in the seminar when you can watch me to uh, struggle with my notes and try to sum up a discussion in just a couple of minutes. And I, in this uh, conference on climate justice, I'm going to do great uh, injustice to all the speakers and, and the discussion. But here are my takes on where we are and, and what we should do next. Um, I think, and I have five points. So the first one is basically that um, I think something that both Emily and, and Sebastian at least spoke about, namely that environmental democracy, environmental justice, it's a bit like human rights and world peace. Uh, I mean, we all want it, but it's always a question of how it's being implemented and, and, and what the practices are for delivering those issues. And something that Har also brought up was how very closely tied, I mean, we can think that procedure is boring, but procedure very often is tied to substantive outcomes. And that's why we also need to zoom in on how these decisions are actually taken. And of course, the difficulty that we're tackling in this project is that we're working when it comes to procedure, we're working with the moving target. We're in the middle of a revision procedure, the outcome of which we do not yet know. So there is some uncertainty, but I don't think this should prevent us from working. This should make it all the more exciting. Then the second point, which I think all the speakers highlighted in their submissions, is that what we're tackling basically is a systemic problem. You know, it's, it's not tied to just this particular context, but it's a broader problem. Uh, I mean, Marilina was talking about, you know, we don't know what is the measure of general scope. We don't know what, what is the measure of individual scope. Uh, we have problems if, with implementing measures, which basically empty the many of the procedures from significant. Uh, and and the, the whole system of internal review is not working uh, 
uh, as it should. So we're in a way witnessing a, a, <laughs> a legal failure and a sort of systemic failure, but also a complete institutional <laughs> failure, which puts us in a very vicious circle in the sense, because what we see, we feel that the commission is not implementing the regulation as it does, as it should, and probably many of the other EU bodies um, as well. And then we're looking in the direction of the court to address this, and the court is not addressing it. It's not recreating Plowman uh, as it should. <laughs> and then we look back at the commission who is not doing its job in the first place. So it goes on and on. And you know, we, you know, we can blame many of these um, institutions, but obviously they're all a part of, of the pattern that, that we're looking at. Uh, so it's a broad problem. <laughs> it's a broad institutional problem in addition to being a legal problem. The third point I think is very important and something was said about it today, but I think it needs much more looking into it, which is the problem of an uneven playing field, which many of you highlighted, that economic actors are in a stronger role uh, than many of the civil society actors. And this is something that we have to zoom in uh, on. The fourth point then <laughs> is what we should do as researchers. And I think um, we're in a very happy position in the sense that this project was from the beginning uh, designed as an empirical project. And I think our job is in a way to actually look into these practices, uh, look at these excuses <laughs> saying, you know, this is not a problem or we have a complete system of remedies and explain through empirical research that this is not the case. And in the, the, the problems that we see actually turn into problems of implementation. Finally, uh, the fifth one to sum up, <laughs> to conclude, and I think this is very much inspired with, what, with, by what, uh, what Sirva was saying. I mean, we're in a situation where the legislative framework might change, and we all hope that it might change, but we also fear that it's not changing enough. So we will be working with the moving target, uh, which will not probably be too perfect uh, in the end. But is that really the real problem? I mean, we can now think, you know, if only the law changes, then the world will be a good place. But I don't think that's going to solve the problem. And I think many of you spoke about today. Uh, it's not only a legal problem, it's also an institutional problem. There is enormous reluctance to give effect to the rights that are already there to deliver on the commitments that the EU has. And simply changing the law will not uh, probably cure this whole broader problem that we can see. And I think that in a way throws the ball again back at us as, uh, as researchers, as civil society representatives. What can we do in order to overcome this problem? How can we convince the institutions that it's actually in their interest to be more proactive, to be more open, to create policies that are more legitimate, because I think uh, in sort of making better, more legitimate policies, they're actually ultimately defending their own legitimacy uh, and the legitimacy of the EU. So I think in that area, we would see better policies by an EU that has broader acceptance among its citizens. And that is so important. That's where I leave it today. <laughs> Thank you all for joining today. Uh, please stay in touch. These are the themes that we will be working on and you will be hearing from us again. Thank you very much.